Well, thank you all for being here for the last uh, talk of this uh, series of the fall series of Hot Politics Lab. Um, Pascal Boyer is with us today and he has to do two talks today because he came from far away. So we have to use his time <laughs> the best we can. Um, I will introduce Pascal to you. Pascal Boyer studied philosophy and anthropology at the University of Paris and Cambridge, where he did his graduate work with Professor Jack Goody on memory and oral literature. He has done anthropological fieldwork in Cameroon. Most of his research focuses on the experimental study and evolutionary background of the cognitive capacities that support cultural transmission, particularly in the domain of religious beliefs and behaviors. Pascal Boyer is the author of Religion Explained and Minds Make Societies, I think a must read to everybody interested in political psychology. Uh, after teaching in Cambridge, Lyon and San Diego, Pascal moved to his present position at, as Henry Lewis Professor at Washington University, St. Louis. And today, Pascal is going to explain politics to us. Um, I think we will have a slightly... <laughs> okay. Religion Good Explained enough. Politics. Um, <laughs> We have uh, a slightly longer talk than usual to finish our series around 40 minutes and then we will have a Q&A so you can all ask Pascal questions. We also have guests online. Um, you can send your questions and comments online. We give priority to, to, to those who are here with reading out the questions, but if we have time left, we will read the questions online. Well, Pascal, the floor is yours. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, we were joking with the writer that she sent me all sorts of, you know, details about what I was supposed to do, but I don't read memos and I don't read instructions. So uh, <laughs> the latest one is I'm supposed to explain politics and I'm like, it's still time to leave before I get something for myself. So, uh, but today is a talk that's mostly, uh, it's not really um, that I have a great proposal for anything uh, concerning politics. I'm done. I'm just doing the work of a sort of scientific journalist and uh, telling you what is relevant to politics from the corner of the scientific world or science, social science that I know, uh, which is mostly evolutionary psychologists, and offer uh, these sort of these um, these uh, various findings and models and things as tools that you may find of interest to you. So the main question. Um, here is, you know, since we're talking about these political things, should our um, species evolution by natural selection matter at all. Uh, and after all, you could say, well, there are good reasons why it shouldn't or why I'm, you know, you could say I'm happy that some people do that work, but I don't think it has more, much relevance to what I study. And the main thing, of course, is that we evolved in groups that did not have parliament selections. Uh, well, maybe they did, Honorata will tell us about that, but uh, they didn't have economic policies, aristocracies, or ideology, or political ideologies, not very much. Um, we evolved in small groups, and I think that, in fact, our evolution matters uh, because most of the toolbox of um, mental mechanisms that we use when we're doing politics in the modern sense um, are direct um, consequences of the way we evolved in those small groups. So that's a bit of a, uh, a broad and, and uh, sweeping claim. But the thing is that, um, uh, thankfully, it's made by a whole body of research. That's not mine. So I can be bold because it's other people's arrogance that I convey here and their sort of imperial sense of solving your questions for you uh, by having our tools. So uh, 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 a central question of evolutionary anthropology was always, how do you get here from there? That is, you know, how do you get social complexification? How did politics emerge? And it's true that we have this uh, context that's very well documented about life in small bands um, within larger ethnic groups, probably, or linguistic groups with very little accumulation and, um, and social structure that is there, but the most important one being the sexual division of labor and some specialization and political structures of a kind we'll talk about a bit more and um, uh, we talked about in the in this um, in this workshop earlier which is pretty uh, informal and rather flat in its hierarchical structure so we got we had that 
And then we get all sorts of things that have been uh, documented in evolutionary anthropology, like the larger concentrations of some uh, spaces, the, the appearance of cities, the appearance of economic accumulation, uh, slavery, class, aristocracy, social stratification in general, and political structures that um, some anthropology, um, some anthropologists did a fairly good job of giving us fairly precise description of what are bands, tribes, chiefdoms, kingdoms, uh, city-states, and things like that uh, in pretty um, precise terms. The question is how do you get from there to this thing, which includes our modern world? So there are two accounts of that. The standard account that you find in lots of anthropology about this is that um, is a kind of functionalist account in the sense that uh, by just having more people or having more accumulation of resources, you create all sorts of challenges. So, for example, there's that um, popular notion that we have something called the, 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 the tension of uh, high density living. And that creates, because it creates lots of conflicts of interest between people, uh, creates the need for centralized punishment, for example, um, and stable norms of interaction between people. Um, and somehow, and that's been the story of um, um, evolutionary political anthropology for, for decades, well, somehow people find a solution. So the state is the solution to some of those problems. Uh, the um, establishment of religious norms can be the solution to other, uh, other problems like that. So it's functionalist in the sense that the idea is that, well, when there is a problem, uh, there is an institution, and that institution happens to be the one that solves those problems. The problem about that is that it sort of um, re requires a mental tool toolbox that's extremely vague. And in the anthropology of social complexification, people use words like um, humans being rational, creative. Um, they have foresight into social problems and social dynamics and things like that. And there is no clear uh, description of what those capacities are, except that they are by some ad hoc magic. They're exactly the ones we would have needed if we had to uh, solve those problems. And in case you think this is um, uh, perfectly fine, you have to realize that lots of other species are stuck in equilibria where there is no, where there is a tragedy of the commons, there is a sort of over exploitation or sort of uh, of some um, of some uh, individuals and so on. So uh, the fact that you get out of a certain um, um, equilibrium and you get to another one is absolutely not a trivial uh, question. So the alternative that I'm reporting on is a whole bunch of research from people who say, well, no, the toolbox is already there. It's just that it's used in slightly different contexts. And the idea, I mean, I talk here about three kinds of systems that are there, but the, the idea is that there are external cues that people receive that are filtered by those systems. And those systems were there by virtue of natural selection for half a million years. Um, and these produce all these very specific inferences about, you know, this policy is bad, this uh, regime is unfair, or this is a right decision, that sort of thing. There is a whole field of evolutionary political psychology, and it's a bit embarrassing for me to be reporting on something that uh, in many ways is uh, is happening in Amsterdam. So, uh, you know, it's a bit like shipping calls to Newcastle to come and, you know, talk about um, some of these things uh, here. But, you know, we have a whole sort of series of things like, you know, the mismatch between um, old conditions and modern politics, political persuasion, the emergence of leadership in communities that are originally sort of rather um, hierarchical and so on and so forth. All those things, there's lots of people doing that research. And I'm sort of not reporting on the details of those things, but reporting on the lessons of all these things, which are not my research, but the research that I know, uh, for the general questions that we were talking about today. And particularly for three questions that are, you'll see that, you know, these questions are anything but uh, modest little questions. Uh, one is, why are there leaders and chiefs at all? You know, why is there leadership in the species? 
And the question is that usually, uh, so I, I want to um, warn you against disappointment. Uh, the, the, the whole thing that I'm talking about does not say why there is leadership, but it says what is the psychological makeup such that that can be done by humans. And that if you had dolphins, maybe it wouldn't be like that. If you had ants, it would be done in different ways, etc. And to say the other question, just as uh, limited and modest, is why oppression or exploitative institutions where one group can uh, um, um, accumulate resources produced by others? And again, the question is not how does that happen? The question is, what is the psychology that makes it possible for those people to do that and for the others to see it as some possible social arrangement? And the third one is uh, much more um, speculative. Uh, one, which is what is the psychological background such that people might think, and that's especially the case in some modern uh, places, that the political regime is actually just, that is legitimate. Again, the question is not how does that happen? There, there are legitimate regimes, but what could be the, the, the psychology of it such that if you ask the dolphin, suppose we can you know, talk dolphin, if you ask them that question, that question would seem totally absurd to them or meaningless, so, you know, whereas to a human being, it seems perfectly uh, natural and intuitive. So the question, the first one is about leaders, and there's been lots of research in, um, in both the psychology and anthropology on, um, on, the, on uh, leadership. And one thing, so if you see these things as uh, a biologist, you, you, you have a notion of um, a leadership that's a bit sort of special because you have to define it in such a way that you could describe it without using the notion of leader or chief of it. And si simply it's the idea of asymmetrical influence in uh, the extent to which one organism's preferences uh, rank the behavior of other um, organisms. Now, what we find is that what's universal in human beings, but also in other um, species, is uh, hierarchies. And we kind of sort of uh, try to understand what is the psychology involved in turning these things into political leadership the way we know it. And for example, is it the same, are the uh, political hierarchies the same as hierarchies in other animal species? The answer is no, uh, really not. Uh, they're very different. So just to mention the evolutionary background of those uh, of the emerg emergence of leadership, we know two, that two things are, I mean, yeah, that uh, several things are very special to human. One is the extension of what biologists call um, fitness interdependence. That is the fact that my fitness, fitness depends on the behavior of others and vice versa, which can be seen in kin selection, that like, the fitness of my children depends on what I do. Um, reciprocal altruism when you exchange um, um, favors, uh, mutualistic cooperation, which is what we call human cooperation. And uh, there are two very special features of humans, maybe not unique. Um, one is collaborative production, which is um, found in humans, but also found in so-called eusocial species, and etc. But eusocial species are irrelevant to us because eusocial species are made up of, of organisms that are um, genetically related. So the whole question of how they get there to their um, Production, production, uh, collaborative production is completely different from ours. It's not the same biological pathway. And one thing that humans do as well, as well is production hierarchies. So, to the extent that we find hierarchies in humans, there are so all hierarchies that we find in other species are exclusively consumption hierarchies. That is, one animal takes more of uh, something than others. Uh, human uh, hierarchies are mostly production hierarchies, so people organize themselves in hierarchies as a way to make things. So you find that in hunting, uh, shelter production, group defense, and things like that, where you find that the production is collaborative. Uh, it takes the form of collective action, you could say. That there's division of work and orchestrated multi-agent. Uh, operation. So these are things that are typical of the species and not of other uh, species. Now um, I will skip on the. So these are there are background capacities that humans have and happen to 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 have them. Um, you know that are relevant to this, uh, like theory of mind that is understanding what other people are thinking about and what they want and what they know. 
Uh, but there are uh, relevant uh, capacities that we find in interesting sort of um, in an interesting sort of convergence. If you uh, read the literature from developmental psychology, from organizational psychology, and from evolutionary anthropology, you find the same sort of the convergence on the same sort of things that we have a psychology such that we detect hierarchies very easily on cues that are not uh, explicit generally that we attune, that is, we tune our behavior to what the hierarchy well, is, that when people have conflicts about uh, hierarchies, there are generally conflicts about the mapping between competence and influence. Mm -hmm. So that's very general in uh, modern organizations, but it's also the case, as we discussed today, in very small scale societies. That uh, So this is not sure like um, animal hierarchy, hierarchies. And the relevant psychology here leads to something that was uh, very aptly described by uh, people like uh, Mark Van Vuurt, um and um, Chris and Rudin and people like that as a leader follower psychology, uh, because it, a psychology that allows us to play leader follower games. Uh, it seems to us sometimes in our naive sort of um, uh, political uh, intuitions that leadership is good. Yes, of course, it's good to be a leader. There are lots of um, Things like you amplify your preferences. So your preference guide the behavior of more people than yourself. There are also other fitness advantages like, you know, um, sexual selection and stuff like that. But there are great incentives for followership, uh, which are the benefits of coordination. And also that the opportunity costs of being a follower are generally less than being the, uh, than the cost of um, being a failed um, uh, leader or sort of, of having a failed attempt at leadership. So we, we and in general anthropologists would tell you, well, this leader follower psychology has an immediate coordination effect, which is very spontaneous in human beings. So as I was saying earlier today, if we decided that we're going to have a big party after this, uh, there will emerge little teams of specialists for drinks, music, dance, you know, whatever. And those teams will have a little sort of pyramid of influence where some and those pyramids of influence I have a small are generally based on some sort of in, intuitive sense of competence uh, that emerges very quickly. There's a whole lot of um, organizational psychology that uh, is, is really relevant to that. So this has coordination um, functions. Coordination is based on largely on competence and people like uh, Mark Van Vuurt would say that, well, this is a model in which there is a managerial model of political authority. Now, um, with a sort of uh, special twist that a large uh, um, amount of, um, of um, political sort of competence in small groups is intergroup conflict. And that puts a special twist on, on, uh, on this um, Rule. So what's the consequence of that is that you have, the, for example, the emergence of primitive so-called chiefs. I, I put quotes because of technical vocabulary that they're not really chiefs, so it doesn't matter. Um, those chiefs have certain advantages and people want to be chiefs because of some reproductive advantages. But those people have limited domains of authority. That's a very general sort of feature of those small scale uh, leaders. They do conflict resolution, some group relations or things like that. But they have limited authority in the sense that the very generally, if they try to overstep to to go a bit beyond those uh, agreed domains of competence, they're very quickly uh, told to uh, do something else and that they are replaceable. But you also have the same managerial model that I think uh, drives people's um, intuitions about technocracies, bureaucracies, the fact that um, uh, that we, we we think that to a certain degree uh, there is a mapping between the hierarchy of influence, be it from political leaders, but also from institutions like you know people who tell you how much meat to eat or stuff or stuff like that, between the competence and the influence, um, and that's also why people, in some conditions. Um, seem to accept what uh, Hibbing called the stealth democracy model, in which you'd rather some specialist did all this technical stuff that is intrinsically boring, um, 
And but the limit to that, the limit to that is uh, the other side of that coin, which is that this is based on a model in which there is an intuition that these people are in a sort of collective action with you, that they're not cheating, in other words, that they're not uh, doing. So you have this balance. Uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, Hibbing um, and Ty Smalls published their model, which is very nice and influential, uh, based on data from the US in the 1990s. If, they'd, if you'd just sort of frozen these two political scientists and sort of, you know, reanimated them in 2015, <laughs> They would have had, you know, probably the opposite sort of results, um, because the problem about this sort of um, leader follower psychology is that um, it cannot work unless it's accompanied by a very strong sense of cheetah detection, which is something that we know is in our intuitive toolbox. And when you have the um, when you have that sort of sense that the um, authorities are not in this sort of mutually uh, mutually advantageous um, model. Then you get um, what we discussed very recently, which is modern populism. I I wanted to talk about this uh, thing, but it's something we can talk in discussion. That you know we tend to think of populism or following the leader as a very general thing. You know people like this person, so this person becomes surrounded by a halo of authority and quasi-religious competence and all that. And people who study these things tend to, sh well, the studies tend to show that no, there is a certain sense in which when you have threat to your group, you follow the leader, you follow the leader that demonstrates some cues of dominance as opposed to trustworthiness. However, for example, in social psych studies, uh, there were those really nice studies for George Bush after the um, Twin Tower attacks, the terrorist attacks in New York, where you might have thought that because his approval rate jumped to from you know 50% to 92% or something like that. But if you did those uh, social psychology um, sort of um, studies, you'd see that an enormous majority of people now try to think that he was a great leader because he had warlike qualities, coordination capacities, intelligence, no, charm, no. Etc. So, you know, the mind is more domain specific than we think. It's not that we suddenly sort of invest all the um, leadership in this person. OK, so um, uh, so this is an example in which we have the toolbox of the leader for psychology, and this seems to apply in modern contexts as well as old ones. The second part of this is another bit of toolbox, which does not explain dominance, but it explains why people understand what's what they have to do in situation of dominance and uh, exploitation. So we have a general transition to chiefdoms, um, states, etc. that is well documented in archaeology and anthropology. But the psychology for it is entirely ad hoc. So the people say, well, you got larger communities, so people knew what to do in order to to um, to to have that. And in the case of exploitative dominance, uh, anthropology has a very little, very very um, poor uh, record of ex explaining why is it the case that people accept those regimes. You know, those questions were asked by people like Laboisi, Hume, uh, all sorts of uh, Locke, obviously. And but anthropologists have a very poor answer, but it's good to mention it because it tells us what not to do. Um, anthropologists also generally was that, well, there is dominance because there is a, an ideology of dominance and that people swallow this ideology of dominance. They accept it. It becomes their sort of mental software and they apply it to their regime and they think, well, yes, I mean, it's 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 quite true that uh, for example, the um, in Hawaii, that's an example I will uh, use, that the aristocrats are closer to the gods than we are. Therefore, it's normal that they are um, that they have more. Or if you're in a sort of Indian system, you you uh, swallow a sort of ideology of purity. That means that certain groups of castes are intrinsically better than you are, and therefore you accept their dominance. Now. This used to be the sort of standard position of anthropologists about that, but the problem is that the evidence doesn't show that. So first of all, uh, James Scott and other people have documented all these uh, things that, for example, the degree of 
um, private belief in the purity ideology goes down as you go down in the caste system in India. That is basically only the people that benefit from it directly think that it's a very, it's a jolly good system and it's actually quite accurate. Um, so you have these sort of phenomena where, whereby anthropologists tend to have mistaken the overt acceptance of a system for a cognitive, you mm -hmm. know, penetration of the ideology into people's minds. Uh, but also this problem with the uh, dominant ideology is that it doesn't explain the sudden reversals. So suddenly you remove uh, part of the regime and the whole thing collapses. So, uh, so for example, at the end of communism, you know, you have these sort of uh, funny things where people say, well, you know, uh, of course, I never believed that Mao Zedong's thoughts were profound. I mean, come on, have you read the thing? I think, yes. But a year ago, you couldn't say that without being, you know, killed. So, uh, so it's not that the regime really. Um, so, why underpins? Uh, what is there to underpin acceptance? Um, evolutionary psychologists would say, well, one crucial point here is coalitional psychology, and coalitional psychology is basically the way we build alliances that can be very small or huge. One contribution of evolutionary psychology is to try and demonstrate maybe not demonstrate, but try to demonstrate that it's the same psychology that organizes your little clique in your department, uh, your group of friends, you know, to organize a party, but also uh, your appreciation of the ethnic group you belong to or your football club, which to my shame, I have no idea what club it is, but every time I give the talk and I use this picture, everyone tell me how long it is. Arsenal, maybe? No, no? I don't think so. I'm very disappointed by Dutch people. Is is it a Dutch team? <laughs> no, but people are supposed to know these things. Oh, like, so apparently we're not coalitional. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to a bunch of foreigners here, so it doesn't matter. Okay, <laughs> but we know that um, human Manchester group. United. Sorry, was it Manchester? Manchester. I, I think it was Man United because yeah, of the yeah, red. Yeah, exactly. But you know. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> The sponsor, yeah. Yeah, there's so many red things. I think Magnus should have his uh, residency revoked for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so conditional psychology is something whereby you know we create these alliances. These alliances are fairly um, stable ways of generating social support, and. Uh, they have they go with that intuition that people have, and we know from psychologists that they have it from a very early age. The intuition that the benefits um, are diffuse. So what when you participate in those coalitions, you get uh, co collective benefits, even if you have uh, private costs. Sometimes they also, and that's also something that uh, even young children seem to to understand, and it's universally present. This intuition that coalitions are rival because social support is a rival good. You mm -hmm. can't support all the people all the time, you know, so there is a sense in which you have to create cliques in which you have higher social support. But that's at the, the, the other side of that coin is that you intrinsically try to work towards the other coalition having less. Um, so and it also requires things like uh, monitoring of people's commitment. Because, you know, we, we uh, so for example, in any sort of situation of ethnic uh, conflict, we have to know to what extent other people are committed to 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 being members and uh, need for signaling. You have to to show that you're a member of the coalition. And an interesting thing that you find in human coalitions is that humans have alliances that are extremely large, extremely stable. Uh, with long term cooperation. There's um, tons of interesting footage I could show you if I wasn't limited with this very autocratic uh, system uh, that uh, show chimps. Uh, though chimps are fairly stable, a bit like humans, but baboons, for example, very often do things like three of them attacking some outsider. And then on the way, running towards the outsider, one of them completely forgets what the collective action is and starts sort of finding some food and just forget. <laughs> and that way the outsider, you know, is just not chased out. So the, the, the whole thing unravels simply because people are, don't have the 
you know, the software that you have to have this um, incremental cost that lead to diffuse benefits for everyone. But that can have an, an effect on uh, politics, which is that um, you can have dominant power of a clique over larger um, uh, masses of people in one condition, which is that the uh, clique is a collective action, action that has high coordination in the ocean of people who have lower coordination. If that happens, then there is a possibility of exploitation and dominance. This is not a new point because if you read Le Boisie or David Hume, you find that they had this intuition, but they didn't talk the game theory kind of thing. So they didn't say it that way, but they actually had this idea. So I think that's, well, the effects of, of on politics of having coalitional psychology, we, we know the obvious effects like parties, factionalism and stuff like that. And indeed, a, a debate in evolutionary anthropology about modern politics is this sort of distinction. So in modern politics, do the different affiliation result from different visions of sort of basic basic kind of quasi instinctual sort of ideas that sharing is better than dominance or dominance is better than sharing? Or do they just result from arbitrary selection of I'm with this and this and that groups? So there are people like David Pinsoff and uh, Marty Hazelton who sort of say that American politics, that all the sort of paradoxes of combining weird things in the same political package occur because simply people have chosen a group and that if you're in this group, you're for black people, but against poor whites. Uh, and, you know, or you're, you know, and once you have this, you select your preferences in terms of policies entirely on the basis of that coalition or grouping. Other people are telling them you're insane. There is actually a sort of ideological thing because otherwise people would not even understand what their own ideology is. So that's the debate, but the debate is really about how does coalitional psychology work? Um, yes, so the idea is that a, a group with high coordination will dominate a group with low coordination. Uh, I have two examples of that, uh, which I thought were really great. One is, um, so because the idea is that once this small group has higher coordination, what it must do is maintain higher coordination, which is can be done in many ways. But also another thing is to avoid the other guys getting more coordination. Uh, so, for example, um, Soviet ideological training in factories and all that seemed to be very much like that. People had Marxism lessons, you know, so you have to stop making your tractors or whatever to have lessons in Marxism, Leninism, Leninism taught by people who don't believe it to students who never believe it. Anyway, everyone knowing it's a kind of joke. However, the thing is that these are the only places where the whole um, it, where the, the, the factory workers actually meet. That's the only place, the only place where you have collective mm. discussion and all that are the ones where there's that, that agent is there too. So in a way that's enforcing a sort of lower coordination that can't talk about anything else. And I thought this example was very striking when I realized that it's exactly like classical Hawaii that is, you know, before the colonization. Well, you had this aristocratic system where the idea is very simple. The idea is that the aristocrats own the land and they own the land because they're closer to the gods, because the gods really ultimately own the land and they give it to the aristocrats. The aristocrat class is nice enough that they lease the land to the commoners and the commoners, when they die, have to return, their families have to return the land to the aristocrats. They have to give Basically, it's a very exploitative system in which they have to give quite a bit of their produced sort of surplus to, to the elite. But the interesting thing is that in classical Hawaii, you could not have any event that, um, that involves, you know, uh, more than a family without having it become a ritual with a priest and the priest is there to fill the space with that discourse. And I think there's that sort of the discourse about aristocracy and the gods and land tenure being divinely sanctioned and stuff like that. And it seemed to me that there was that clear attempt to, yes, literally fill the public space 
with that stuff so that people can't talk about anything else. But maybe that's um, over interpretation, I don't know. Okay, and finally, we're going super fast, but um, there is a much more speculative sort of notion here, which is that the notion, a notion that seems very modern is the notion of legitimacy, legitimacy and the fact that some political orders could be just. Um, and, you know, when you think about it, so here we are talking about the perception of it, not the fact that it is uh, no normative sort of things. So when you, um, and I think I can, we can relate that to the psychology of collective action again. Um, that um, no, people have the intuition and that they've had this intuition because they are human beings, that um, success of many actions is conditional upon the, the participation of lots of people. And those people are paying costs by participating, but the benefits are diffuse and they will come but they, they depend on the amount of participation. So people think like that. We know about that. We know of the sort of consequences of that, that people think that defection is a danger because it actually is a danger. Um, people value participation independent of any consideration of what benefits this participation could bring. So there's quite a lot of social psychology showing that just participating in collective action is seen by other people as a sign of good character and a sign of potential cooperation sort of value. So people are valued because they have this uh, preference. So the effects on politics is very, very uh, uh, speculative. The idea is that in some conditions, people might be seeing the whole polity or the political order as a form of collective action. And that would be the case if there are cues that tell them that this, um, this, um, the political order is a form of collective action. For example, universality, because the point of collective action is that the individual preferences are not the uh, guiding uh, force in what we do, that the rules are stable, that there are penalties for non-participation, uh, that there are benefits. All these things happen to be um, things that it seems political scientists tell us are cues that give people the idea that the, regi the regime is legitimate. So uh, we were talking about that earlier that, for example, it seems that um, social welfare systems that give you a little something every now and then are widely accepted. Uh, whereas in the US, for example, there's welfare system, which actually it seems disperses as much money as the ones we have in Western Europe is seen as widely illegitimate by people because most people will never get a penny out of it. So they have this notion, this, this is a system that is not a collective action, it's a system of exploitation where some, some always take and some always receive. So these cues are cues of connective action, but they're also cues that seem to be uh, described by many political scientists as cues of legitimacy, hence the proposal that the two are just one thing. It's exactly that. It's exactly the same thing. Okay, so the main sort of idea is that the ancestral toolbox is sufficient. You know, we have uh, the political psychology, for for example, is something that we have, and we have enough of it from our sort of ancestral past to do the modern politics. Of course, we need also all the uh, accretion of um, rules uh, that we have on, on top of that. So I, I will uh, skip this. This is not very really important. Um, yes, so the idea is that, yes, we have this sort of collection of systems, like I described three of them, but the idea is that they all three could be plausibly related to some cues we get from external information and some uh, specific intuitions we have about a specific situation. But all three, you could say, are rather well documented um, independently documented uh, psychological, sorry, um, capacities that we can plausibly relate to uh, evolutionary uh, systems. Okay, so the idea is that um, we Stone Age people can have politics, so we go from here to there. I don't know what this guy is doing there, but he wasn't supposed to be that side. So this is the pristine state. Ethnographer. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, I mean, you guys are not anthropologists, but there are pictures of anthropology in the making by Malinowski that look exactly like this, mm -hmm. except Malinowski is there at this uh, desk, there's the interpreter, but the natives are queuing up. There's a line, mm -hmm. and he asks them, you know, for a myth, they tell them, they say, next information. I wish anthropology would be so easy to do. But. <laughs> okay, so the idea is that those systems that are described are learning systems. So they're learning systems that tell you what is the configuration of collective action, for example, in my social environment. What is the kind of leadership we have? What is the mapping between competence and hierarchy in my social environment? And people receive those cues and are good at learning what the local rules of the game are, but they don't need to have an extra set of mental software to do that. The mental software they have from um, our sort of spontaneous development as human beings is sufficient. Um, so yes, the ancestral skills in question are things like production hierarchies, coalition psychology, and the sort of moralized form of collective action. And the idea is that modern institutions uh, really fit ancestral capacities in some way. So that we can conclude after 39 minutes and 50 seconds, that the Stone Age uh, toolbox is sufficient. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I feel really guilty now that we didn't see these gorillas or chimpanzees running around. Oh, yeah, yeah. But um, oh, yes, um, I will take questions now from the audience. Uh, we have Enzo there. And then Gustavo. Thanks very much for this. So, about the formation of psychology, about yeah. I was just wondering, you probably know the work of Vivek Chiber, a sociologist at. Oh. Vivek Chiber, a sociologist at. No, we don't. And know. we want class versions of this kind of rational choice uh, uh -huh. coordination. Problems to show why ideology is not needed to explain right. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, here's two points though. I think him being a sort of evil fashion Marxist has a view that it's not just um, an adaptive psychological trait to have these coalitions, but that certain kinds of uh, ways of organizing the economy are more conducive than others to oh, yes. elites being able to do that. Of so course. He has a whole argument for why. It's easier for capital to coordinate than labor. Sure. For you know various kinds of reasons. So there is that. Yeah. The other thing, um, and so I wonder if, if that's compatible. I know it's not your story, but I wonder if something like that is compatible with your story. Mm -hmm. you see what I mean? And there's something, but there are differences between uh the production hierarchies that make yeah. the, a certain kind of coalition amongst the elite uh more successful than all. And also this part, because otherwise I will forget the no, this one is really uh, interesting, crucial, and it's true that we get this sort of exploitative hierarchies in some uh, conditions that are very far from the sort of Marxian accumulation. Like, for example, Northwest uh, Coast Indian societies, where you have huge accumulation, slavery, class distinctions, and all these things happen with an ideology of kind of religious purity that justifies all that. So, sorry. Yeah, well, that's really right. And the other thing is, just for observation, um, so suppose that we buy this kind of rational choice story that I know there's no need to. Yeah. To, I mean, I'm inclined to buy. Anyway, this doesn't rule out the, well, several people have argued that it's still there is a kind of a demand side, a demand on the demand side for ideology, meaning that mm -hmm. it makes it easier for you to accept your position, your position in the hierarchy, even if it's not necessary to. I explain the self reproduction of the system. Now, the interesting thing is that this model is that then it becomes very easy to see why it's weakly blocked, say, after the fall of communism. Oh, I Because there's no more demand for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, does this make, and this is my own uh, little sort of pet peeves or my, my little hobby watch, but I think if we take this to the next level, so, so the people who make this argument, they usually say, then there's no reason to study ideology because it has no explanatory power. But it's not true because it seems to me that tracking the beliefs still will tell you where the power really is. Of course. Because it matches on to where the power really is, mm -hmm. even though it's not explanatory vis a vis the persistence of the power. No, that's true. And the, the coordination effects of having that shared ideology can, can work for the exploited populace as well because you know you have a better sort of predictive power on what the others are doing. So uh, there are situations which the um, uh, oppressive uh, way of filling space 
uh, really creates pluralistic ignorance. Uh, like sort of the East German kind of case would be like that, and and I think towards to some extent the classical Hawaii was like that that like that that you have a strong suspicion. It seems to be evidence to that effect. You seem to have suspicion that no one among the commoners likes this this uh, order, but you don't know about any single person. You can't tell because there's no way to communicate about that. So um, in those cases, so but there there may be cases in which the sharing the um, uh, official ideology of dominance also gives you some sort of predictive power of you know what the other dominant dominated people are are doing, which is in a way a benefit. So yeah, no, I understand that point. Was that what was next? So out of all of these tools that are present in the toolbox, um, I was wondering that maybe some of them could be more evolutionarily conserved than others. Really? So for example, you can look back at a, a dominance tendencies hierarchies, and you can see that a lot of mammals have these uh, submit yeah. and rejection. Yeah. 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 Then you can look at coalition, and you can look at chimpanzees, how they mm. jump into groups and fight each other yeah. almost like modern. Yeah. Or, yeah, uh, and then you also look at fairness, which might be a bit more dubious and complex. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. We have these experiments with macaques being given, sure. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eaters, they see another macaque eating fruits and they reject, and they reject the so, yeah, Yes, the, 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 no, no, no. So, I was wondering, that's yeah. could, can we say that a species becomes capable of politics when they put all of these tools together? Oh, that's a really great point. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that's very interesting. I hadn't thought of that that way because. There's a very general, so I talked a little bit about other species, but in evolutionary psychology, there's a general sort of tendency to uh, to try to disregard phylogeny. Because the idea is, well, we're a different species. So anyway, it's, it's, it would be just as absurd to, to look at our cousins, primates, as to look at dolphins or ants or stuff like that, because we have very different selective pressures. We solve <laughs> problems in a very different way. This being said, of course, uh, in the sort of from the uh, neurophysiology of these things to the hormonal consequences to the behavioral, you know, gestures, you get some phylogenetic effects, uh, uh, sort of um, um, continuities. And that is why the two year olds, for example, are extremely good at detecting hierarchies because they see that, you know, there's a certain sense of a certain hierarchy that we see very easily. Um, but yeah, I hadn't thought about that. And it's, it's interesting sort of um, um, discussion. The, as I said, the general sort of thrust in um, sort of more evolutionary uh, uh, psychology in a paradoxical way is to try and not talk about that too much because um, what people want to do is to look at our ancestral conditions when we are modern humans. Uh, infer some challenges, etc., then predict psychological capacities from that, then test them. And in that sort of path uh, research program, uh, the fact that this one is older and that one seems to be an innovation is not relevant. Yeah, but I, I understand, uh, I agree that they differ. Small follow-up question. Do you think that this would happen or is it only relevant in Homo sapiens? Or could we go a little bit? Yeah, like, so, like this and... yeah, yeah. That's every time you know you say that. So someone will say, "Well, hang on, you 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 drawn the line at say three hundred thousand years ago. What do you think people before that were doing? No politics. No, that's absurd. Um, the problem is that then and that's the reason why evolutionary psychologists don't want to do that. Uh, to go that way, but it, is that then you have a simple problem that it, you know you have no evidence. You don't know how those groups manage their, their stuff. Uh, the, the evidence we have for group decisions, etc., becomes clear when we have evidence for collective hunting, for um, shelter constructions in which you see the DNA of various people has been left. Uh, so you, you get all these sort of things that but they were for, for it, that's when humans start doing all these collective action things. Maybe they did some a lot before. We don't know. So. Thanks. Other questions or thoughts? Yes, go ahead. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. You could ask a question on this. I'm not an expert at all, but this uh, this summer I read a book. It was by two anthropologists. It's called The Dawn. It was called The Dawn of Everything. <laughs> the okay. one, sorry. The Dawn of Everything. Oh, yes. So uh, and, and basically, they, well, they mentioned all kinds of uh, deviant cases, for instance, like uh, like that there was like a huge time when there was agricultural without dominance. Also, yes, yes, like yes. Tri Native American tribes where the uh, yeah, where they alternate sure, yeah. uh, like the power like uh, during one season, like one group, uh, they, they act as police officers and then one mm -hmm. the other season it's, it's a different group. Yeah. So they come up with all kinds of DJ sure. cases and their messages like uh, like, yeah, like don't think that's yeah the, the system that we have nowadays that was bound to be or something. Right, yeah. Whereas yeah, from your your talk, well, I get the impression it's a yeah. kind of psychological makeup. So yeah, the, the, my question is, what is your position relative to this? Book? No, okay, so um, uh, God, what's their names? I can't remember. But their um, names are Wengra and Yeah, I'm not an expert at all. This is based no, 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 my no, 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 knowledge no. on this topic. So yeah. so. <laughs> 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 uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, part of the of the book uh, consists in saying things that are fairly accepted in evolutionary anthropology, and uh, but are not, you know, uh, always there in the textbooks and stuff like that. But they're fairly accepted, and yeah, part of their rhetorical strategy was to bang on the table and say, "Come on." It was like that, you know, there was this. So, for example, the emergence of large communities uh, without the usual signature of social stratification. Yeah, that's true. And that is a recent uh, sort of thing that that, that the anthropologists have realized that. So uh, when I gave my little sort of uh, Mickey Mouse rendition of social complexification, uh, that shouldn't be taken as the, the you know the, the, the whole story about that. And we have lots of examples of that. Um, so basically what they say empirically uh, in their book is is actually what most um, um, evolutionary anthropologists would say, yes, is the, what we now know. Uh, then they get there's a whole sort of modern political thing on top of that for a kind of um, uh, intuitive anarchism uh, among humans, which is also something that many anthropologists defend, uh, but is much more sort of uh, difficult to establish and all that. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's um, so for example, you get, um, there are lots of large scale communities in the, in the Middle East long before there were city states and, um, and uh, stratified kingdoms. But then they disappeared because the ecology wasn't good for large concentrations of people. That's all. Uh, and in the classical sort of heading of the story, uh, those people don't used to not have a large place because they didn't leave much. But now we have better techniques and we see they exist. So yeah, that's that's perfectly fine. But I was uh, confined to 40 minutes, so you know, if you. <laughs> Your <laughs> Thank you. Very interesting. Um, yesterday I attended a, a, a presentation by a psychologist. Uh -huh. It was about the sense of self. And she said that uh, that we create our sense of self based on memories and emotions and the connections between these, 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 these uh, memories and emotions. And she said that is uh, the narrative that we construct of yes. ourselves. So I was thinking you you analyze mostly processes, structures, relationships, um, but we as human beings also tell each other and ourselves stories about yeah. that. Yeah. So to what extent does that play a role? Because you, you didn't say much about about narratives. Language, no, yes, no, uh, uh, because the, the 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 problem is that um, uh, these all these things are crucial in the construction of. Um, of the sort of um, ideology whereby we justify the behavior we'd have for other reasons, you know, like, for example, we have collective action, so we know that um, so people who engage in collective action have an intuitive sense. They're not aware of it, that there are uh, diffuse benefits that everyone will share, that participation is necessary for that. The possibility of cheap defection and, and free riding is a big danger. 
but they don't think explicitly in game theoretic terms. So then they start having this sort of um, ideology that, well, we are, you know, North Amsterdam people. So that's why we're together and we're doing this thing. And you create this sort of idea. And it came from the fact that, you know, a particular person founded this little group, you know, centuries ago, and we had to manage our water and our canals. So we were blah, blah, blah. So it, it, all these things right on top of your intuitions that this is a, a, a group where within which there's high um, um, benefits to be taken from cooperation. So yes, I mean that that then that is the, the 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 business of actual anthropology and history to show how people use these tools like stories and uh, essentialism, for example, to 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 explain to themselves uh, the, the 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 behaviors they have, the preferences they have, and um, and also their intuition about other people's behaviors and preferences. So yeah, it's very important. Yeah. I see no hands anymore. Oh, there is one hand. Yes. Yeah, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just uh, just a quick question. I was just intrigued by uh or I was thinking a little bit about the concept of collective leadership that one can occasionally find oh, yes. in, in some communities and, yeah. and so on. I was wondering how that how should we think about that in this schema? Is that some sort of fusion of coalitions and co collective action and leader follow dynamics or yeah i i don't know i'm really intrigued by those things because mm -hmm. it could be that um yeah because it's it's interesting in general uh when people are faced so i my intuition would be that you have to have strong ideological or you know reasons to try and be like that mm -hmm. Because the the path of least resistance would be to go towards leader follower psychology, mm -hmm. and but I don't know if that's the, the case empirically. Um, I I knew a little bit about the, the, a case like that with this the tiny uh, republic in uh, Tibet that is called the Tai uh, community. It's like many of those places in the mountains; they're very isolated and basically they run their own stuff. Except that there's that there's sort of external thing, which is a bit like the weather. It's like every year the king, the king's sort of uh, people come over and they want taxes, so they take the taxes. So and people from you know a long time try to bribe them, kill them, or threaten them, whatever. But it doesn't work because the, the authorities are. Uh, are pretty powerful. Um, and then because of that, they have this sort of constitutional system in which they have to meet and agree on rules. And there's no way that a rule could have been uh, submitted by one person and be accepted by others without others having made it clear that it would have been their preferences, unless they spoke second instead of first. And everyone sort of starts telling these stories about the fact that it's just a contingent fact that I talked after you. It's not that I'm influenced by you at all. And I think this is a special case where the external, first the, the border you know, between the external and the uh, uh, world and their community is very strong, but also uh, that as it turns out, these decisions are mostly about things that concern taxation and the, the relations with the outside. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I, I would say there may be that, that reason that you, you know, that it doesn't emerge as easily as the production hack. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, it's four o'clock. This is exactly when we should finish. <laughs> Questions. Thank you all so much for being here. Heis has an announcement before we clap, or do we clap first? We clap first. We clap first. <laughs> Because my announcement has little to do with the talk today. Uh, but you also have a mug. Yeah, uh, I do have the mug, but I want to end with that. <laughs> <laughs> you gave it away. <laughs> um, it's the last meeting of the year, so I uh, wanted to thank everyone for joining us here. I mean, Friday for a few months now, it's been really exciting to uh, see such an extension of the lab. A couple of times now, I've told the anecdote that like a year ago, we were pretty anxious about how many people would come to the lab since back then we were at the end of 
I guess, the first big project of the robotics lab. And uh, since then, we've actually tripled in size. So uh, our anxieties are completely unfounded. It's been really fantastic to have so many new PhD students, new research assistants, but also new people like that, for example, uh, joining our lab. It's become very dynamic. Uh, maybe I have to admit a bit too dynamic at some times. <laughs> so I'm happy the holidays are very close. Um, and we're going to start again, of course, uh, next year on January 12th. Uh, we have Josh Pasek from University of Michigan on uh, belief. Belief is information times identity. Okay. Uh, January 19th, we have Insanita Berenke, who was supposed to give a talk mm -hmm. already, but she was ill. Uh, adolescents needs to contribute to society. January 26th, we have Evelyn Krone, uh, professor in developmental neuroscience. Uh, with an SOPS uh, untitled presentation. 